Good evening. I'm Bill Walker. Welcome to Inco Presents. For over a decade now, Cease McKnight has been the voice of news in the Sudbury region. He's a regular in most Sudbury homes, bringing you news of what's happening in the world around you. Well, tonight, we put a face on that voice as we go behind the scenes of a radio newsroom as Inco presents Profile, Cease McKnight. Well, the first thing in the morning, if, you're, if you have a, a, a morning shift and you're coming in for the 6 o'clock news, the one thing that's on my mind is that I'm still very sleepy. And uh, driving into uh, Sudbury, of course, is a... Um, pretty well have the streets and highways to yourself. Of course, in the morning shift, you have... Uh, a backlog of news because the teletype has been operating since the uh, the last newscast of the night which would be probably midnight the station then goes on to automation and of course the uh, the teletype machine keeps running uh, mind you a lot of it is features uh, items farm fare and that type of thing that will come through during the night and uh, but it's all waiting for you there in the morning when you come in. The man that's coming in in the morning, he has to, in that hour, quickly go through his news. Of course, it's all coming out in capsule form or uh, expanded news summaries anyway, but no newsman that I think is worth his salt is automatically going to rip off a, a, a newscast prepared by the teletype, so to speak, and go on the air with it. He's going to be selective. If you're going to give a priority to a newscast and it's going to be the ultimate that you're working for, you're going to start first with your good Sudbury stories, which should be followed then by your regional stories, which should be followed by your national stories, and then your international stories. Now, this is assuming that everything is in that order as far as priority is concerned. Preparing a newscast is an individual's idea of what his listeners would be interested in. And you want to have your listener interested in what you're saying in the news because you want to keep him as a listener. This helps the station. Everything has got to be uh, figured out at the cash register in the end. So regardless of where you spend a dollar in the newsroom, the ultimate result has to be through this line, a listener that's also going to hear the commercials in a private station of this nature. You, when it's a commercial station, you do the best you can to try to create and hold an audience. In a newscast, our little contribution to it is to try and make a newscast as interesting as we can in our mind. You have five minutes for a newscast. You have one minute of that as a commercial announcement if it's a sponsored newscast. Into that five minutes also has to go a weather forecast along with the, uh, the uh, readings, the temperature readings. So you have four minutes, if you're lucky, to give the w news of the world. So you've got you to move. So you have, you've, got a, you've got enough news in front of you that might cover ten minutes, and you're going to fill four. So this is where the bias comes in, as I say. This man that's preparing this four-minute newscast from ten minutes' worth of news is going to select what he thinks his listeners would be interested in. Statistics Canada says unemployment remained steady at 7.2% last month. The unemployment rate increased slightly in Newfoundland and Alberta, remained the same in Quebec and Saskatchewan, and dropped in the other provinces. More than 650,000 people were officially unemployed. A news group, whether it's radio or television or magazine, or newspaper, whichever of the media you want to use, there should be no creating of the type of news that's going to further one side than another. Now, this will come up naturally where there seems to be a interest from the people that you're speaking to, radio audience, the reading uh, of the newspaper, the distribution there. Uh, Morgenthaler, I think, is a, is a classic example of the media going one way 
and possibly against the judicial system and not promoting theirs. Sudbury weather, cloudy periods with a chance of a shower today, mostly cloudy with a few showers or thunderstorms tomorrow, high today and tomorrow, 23 to 25, the low tonight, 11 to 13. It's 15 degrees at CHNO. I'm Bill Walker talking to Wally Morrison, motorman on the Granzenberg train here on the 2,000 foot level of the Coppercliff North Mine. Wally, how do you spend your time when you're not working? Oh, I enjoy the outdoors, fishing and uh, camping, my family. Tell us about your family. I have two girls, one at 21, who's married, has a young daughter, and uh, my oldest, my youngest daughter is eight, going to school. She enjoys the outdoors also. Do you all go camping and fishing together? Most definitely. How about Mrs. Morrison? Oh, well, she's a fishing widow, I imagine. <laughs> How does she feel about that in the spring and the summer and the fall? You got all that great fishing around here. Well, I imagine she's got to go with the punches, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you used to be a hockey player, Wally. Well, we tried a little bit, but uh, turned to mining, I guess. The International Nickel Company of Canada. We're people. Fortunately, in those days it was fortunate, I got a job as a service station attendant in Kitchener. And because Dad, with that time, was uh, driving the electric radio from Preston to Kitchener, I, transportation wasn't a problem. I got $5 a week, which was not too bad. It wasn't too good, but it wasn't too bad. And as I say, I was following my brother's correspondence course, and I came to a, a portion of the lesson that dealt with the bias on tubes, which I just couldn't possibly understand. So I said, uh, there's a radio station here in Kitchener. I'll go and ask them. Maybe they can explain this bias to me. So when I got to the radio station, I found it was studios, and the engineer and the transmitter were in some other part of the city. It was at that point, then, that I got interested in, in the broadcasting end of uh, radio. And I hung around the studios until one day they gave me a job. Well, that was 41 years ago, and that's where I first met my wife, Marion. She was a Kitchener girl, and uh, reading poetry at the CKCR. Writing continuity and uh, typing your uh, continuity for you. There's no comparison between uh, the radio station that I worked at then compared to CHNO right now, or any modern day radio station. Back in those days, we had two piles of records, the old 78s would be about that big round, and we had two stacks of them, one beside the other. And uh, these are what we played as we went through them, we just started over again. The station never operated 24 hours a day, as a matter of fact, I don't believe it operated 12 hours a day. I, I just don't remember when we went on the air in the morning, it would be 7.30 or 8 o'clock signed off in the afternoon and came back on in the evening for a few uh, few hours. And that consisted of the broadcast for the day. One of the uh, reasons I came up to Sudbury was because of Peter Orfankis, who's a very good friend of mine and is the photographer at CKSO. Peter and I were uh, army mates, or buddies together in uh, Newfoundland. I had joined a Lincoln and Welland Regiment later on had been transferred uh, from orders from Ottawa to public relations in St. John's, Newfoundland. We had a wonderful time in, in, uh, in this particular phase of my career. Peter and I worked together. He belonged to the engineers, and uh, they had uh, on their, shall we say, list of people that they can have, they had a, a, a photographer. We were in the uh, public relations, and uh, we were authorized to have a dark room, but we never had a photographer. So it was a happy coincidence that Peter worked uh, for the engineers, but also worked for the public relations and had the use of our dark room. And we came up with uh, a lot of good work in those days. Of course, I had to, to be a, the Canadian reporter, which uh, every noon hour, I either preceded or followed the barrel man. And the barrel man was Joey Smallwood. And 
they listened to him as if it was God speaking in those days, and I was warned never to criticize anything that he had said on his program on my newscast, or I'd be in deep trouble. So I took the warning to heart. Besides the doing the Canadian news for the troops in the area, in public relations, we had to set up uh, displays that would uh, inform the troops of weapons, particularly enemy type of weapons, and do publicity shots for newspapers back home. Quite a bit of research was required into numerous parts of the articles that we had to write or broadcast. We even had to um, do a story on one of the first German submarines that was captured and brought into St. John's Harbor. It belonged to one of the German submarine packs in the North Atlantic, and it had malfunctioned in some manner and had to surface and was captured and brought into St. John's. One of the uh, German sailors from the Wolf Pack when he had been uh, examined, we, we discovered that he had um, theater stubs for uh, a movie house in Halifax in his pocket. So they were getting onto uh, Canadian territory. After leaving St. Catharines and coming to uh, Sudbury, well, that's interesting too, to me it is anyway, because uh, as I say, uh, Peter and I had been army mates. We uh, shared our the same... Uh, quarters and the sergeant's quarters, and uh, he was an old army buddy working up in Sudbury, so I came up, Marion and I drove up Highway 69, and uh, c coming up to see Peter, uh, he had uh, just recently got married to Jean, and uh, they were raising a family and building their home together, and uh, they were quite proud of what they were accomplishing, and we were very proud for them. And. Uh, Peter says, you better come up to the station with me because uh, I have to get some film. And uh, so I walked up to the station, or we drove up to the station, and I was walking down the corridors when the manager of the CKSO at the time, Wolf Fodil, spotted me and uh, later asked Peter quietly who I was. So Peter says, well, he's uh, a radio man uh, from St. Catharines that I know personally. He's up visiting. So the next thing I know is uh, Wolf Waddell corners me and says, uh, how would I like a job in uh, CKSO that they have an opening for the promotion manager's department, or the promotion department, a manager for the promotion department at CKSO covering TV and radio, which is something as far as I was concerned was a mammoth step, plus a, a fair increase in salary to the $75 I was making at St. Catharines at the time, I was going to make $100 a week at CKSO. My next uh, venture in broadcasting came from Blind River because uh, a big strike was looming in uh, Sudbury at the time. That would be back in uh, 1958, I believe. Mine Mill and Inco were at loggerheads, and it was uh, plain as could be that there was going to be a big strike. Sales, which I was on, working on a commission, were starting to drop. Passing through Blind River one day, their new station was just opening up, and, and uh, Mr. Nash uh, says to me, uh, how would you like to come here? And I thought it would be a good opportunity to uh, keep on working while the strike was on. I spent a very nice or good two years in Blind River, uh, Tom Nash, who was the owner of the station during that two years, uh, gradually upped uh, my position until I became the manager of the station. Of course, if you were around at that time or can remember that time, uh, Elliott Lake was a uh, going concern, but the American government failed to renew its contract. It was now discovering its own uranium, and uh, the boom left Elliott Lake, and uh, I left Blind River, because Peter Scott, who was the general manager at uh, CHNO, happened to be passing through Blind River at the time, 
and uh, caught me doing one of the newscasts on uh, CJNR and uh, phoned me up and said, uh, would I be interested in coming to CHNO? And that was 19 years ago. And I've been on news at uh, CHNO since then. It's a very surprising thing to me to have a, uh, a young fellow, and we've got three of them at the station now, uh, will say to me, oh, I, you're C. McKnight, I remember you when I was going to school. You were giving the news then. It kind of sets you back a bit, you know. You, you, you just kind of pause and wonder, how long have I been around here? <laughs> I'm Bill Walker, and I'm talking with Miss Joe Wamsley, who is the receptionist at International Nichols' main office in Coppercliff. How long have you been attached to INCO? 27 years. You must know quite a few people that go through yeah. these doors. Yes, uh, hundreds of them go through. Do they all know you? Well, pretty well. well they all call me by name, and I <laughs> don't know whether they know me or not. But Do you ever have any problems as a receptionist? Ever, anybody ever try to get past you that shouldn't? Oh, once in a while, but uh, they're all pretty nice fellows. And once they find out that you're a catcher in fastball, I don't think yeah. they try to get too far. <laughs> That's right. Once they know I can swing a bat. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you spend your vacations, Joe? In Arizona. Any particular reason for that? Well, I have a sister living there that used to be a receptionist here for 34 years. She... Well, Joe, it looks like it's been very good to you. You look like a million dollars, may I say so? Yes, uh, <laughs> ink was pretty good to me. <laughs> you know, I... The International Nickel Company of Canada. We're people. It's 15 degrees at 6 o'clock, Cease McKnight, CHNO News. There are several things that are in my mind as peaks in, in my work in, as a newsroom. <clears throat> One of the most embarrassing to me, if I may say so, was when President Kennedy was shot. We have a, a serviceman that attends to our teletype. And he comes in and he preps it right down and re-oils it and fixes the, uh, the letterheads, uh, the cap, you know, that prints it out. And uh, during the time that he's working, our teletype is shut off. And we usually say, well, after this summary is through, then you can shut it down because we know that in the next half hour or so, we have enough news on hand to get us through our next newscast and the machine will be typing again before we are going into a, an hour later into another one. It just so happened that the president got shot in this particular instance, and uh, the management of the station come running down to me, and he says, the president's been shot. And, uh, and I says, who, what president? You know, because I wasn't clued in on it, uh, and I thought it could have been the president of Inco or somebody and uh, been wounded. Eventually, when it dawned on me that he was saying the president of the United States had been shot, and my teletype's broken down, and I <laughs> can't go on the air. Boy, I was scurrying around then. We got uh, Canadian press, uh, the CP Communications. They started uh, typing for us immediately, and I ran down and got copy from them. But I was still late. It's uh, proverbial. I really got caught that day. There's been another outbreak of violence in West Belfast, Northern Ireland. Last night, British troops came under fire. From there are instances where we do not, where, where we actually withhold knowledge that we have of a, what would be a news item. We could write it into a news item and put it on the air. For instance, we will not uh, put on the air a telephone bomb threat, we'll say, to a plane at the uh, Sudbury Airport, because we're, we're pretty sure that there are enough nuts around that uh, somebody else is going to get a phone call before very long, just as the uh, the Sudbury General got a phone call about uh, a bomb threats after Donald Kelly was put in there. If the plane has taken off and is in flight and the, the, the search has been completed, then we will put it on the air that there had been a bomb threat and had, it had been a hoax, that nothing had happened from it. Well, the city of Sudbury has, in uh, the 19 years that I've been here now, uh, there has been a tremendous change in Sudbury. Uh, and and I'm just a youngster compared to some of the people that listen to me, you know. They have seen greater changes than I have. But I think downtown core is probably the thing that has changed most that I am witness to, the changing of the post office and uh, uh, 
now is now the busiest corner in downtown Sudbury. You no doubt can recall the days when they used to have a big Christmas tree in front of the old post office. It was a beautiful thing. And of course, I've seen some colorful mares uh, that have run at, for being in office in Sudbury. I never did meet Maxie Silverman, but I understand uh, from the stories I heard of him that he was a re great contribution to Sudbury with his uh, being a retailer of uh, good repute and uh, his being mayor of the city, his interest in the Sudbury Wolves. And uh, following that, there was, of course, Joe. I think Joe Faber was probably the first mayor I had. And uh, I can recall going to a news conference with Joe that Joe had called at uh, City Hall and going into this beautiful office, and here's Joe sitting back with his feet up on this desk, you know. I think one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, was a real catastrophe to us was the time the tower fell down, because the, uh, just one of the big towers at the transmitter, it just fell in the wind. Mary and you were here when that happened, and as a matter of fact, I think that uh, we learned it through you. <laughs> it was very funny. My husband had phoned me up, but Oh, about 7.20 in the morning, and he said, is the power on there? And I said, yes. Well, he said, we're off the air. And uh, with that, I went into the bedroom to make the bed, and I could hardly believe my eyes when I looked out the window, and there was a big tower in a million pieces. So I phoned back, and I said, the reason you're not on the air is because uh, your tower is down, and uh, send the fire department and everybody because the guide wires are right over the hydro poles. And I was afraid the house was going to catch in fire. But uh, they got it all straightened out in pretty good time. I can remember Bill Burgoyne coming up uh, to uh, Sudbury one time. And I, I believe at, back at that time, Bill Burgoyne was the um, chairman or president or whatever the title is of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. And Jim Meeks, who was also interested in uh, the Chamber of Commerce and was then the publisher for the Sudbury Star, had invited Bill up. Bill was my former boss at CKTV. And of course, they brought him on the regular Sudbury tour. And one of the first things he spotted when he came back and made his speech uh, that evening was the fact that we had a liquor store on uh, Hemlock Street, and immediately above it, we had the Children's Aid Society. <laughs> and he just wondered if there was a correlation here of some type. And, and in 41 years of uh, broadcasting, it's, uh, it's been a kind of work that I've liked. I, I can't think of wanting to do anything else, even though I kind of stumbled into it. I have been broken up on the air uh, uh, several times. There, there was a, a time that I can call it was April Fool's Day that I remember. And uh, they had fixed up a, a story for me. And for some reason or other, they had got it into the newscast without my seeing it. And uh, there was a, a moose in... Um, uh, that uh, a stuffed moose, you know what I mean? It was uh, down along Regent Street. It, it's gone now, but uh, it used to be at, at Pitts. So this April Fool's Day, they, they, they had this moose running all over town, and that had finally wound up on Regent Street South. And I had no control over my mic. I had a, a, a cough switch or whatever I wanted to use, but uh, the control room also had control over the opening and closing of the microphone, too. So I come across this story about this crazy moose running around town, you know, and I hadn't seen it before. I'm reading it cold, and all of a sudden, they start laughing, and they come in, and they... I was getting through this all right, up until the point they come in, and they touched me, put the hand on my shoulder, and I broke up. And I started a hee-haw. But it, before I started the hee-haw, I, I, I closed my microphone. But as I say, the control room had control of it, and they had it open. And here I am, roaring away, laughing, and by this time, Mary Thomas, who was our news editor then, she practically rolling on the floor laughing. So this is the time I got broke up. Kenneth Gatlin, president of the British Interplanetary Society, 
says the Soviets could launch a faster vehicle in mid-September and get to Mars ahead of the U.S. And that's the news. Now taking a look at the scoreboard. In National League Baseball last night, Pittsburgh over Atlanta 8-1, New York down San Diego 8-4, Cincinnati took Chicago 9-3, San Francisco beat Montreal 9-2, Houston over St. Louis 7-2, Los Angeles downing Philadelphia 7-1. In the American League, Baltimore shut out Kansas City 4 to nothing, Texas shut out Detroit 7 to nothing, Minnesota edged Milwaukee 8 to 7, California down New York 8 to 1, and Oakland took Boston 4 to 3. Sudbury weather, cloudy periods with a chance of a shower today, mostly cloudy with a few showers or thunderstorms tomorrow, high today and tomorrow 23 to 25, the low tonight 11 to 13. It's 15 degrees at CHNO. Well, with my work at CHNO going along fine, you know, I've been in the broadcasting business for 41 years now, and I still don't know what the bias on a tube is. International Nickel hopes that you have enjoyed tonight's program, and on their behalf, I invite you to join us again next week at the same time, when Inco Presents looks at airplanes and flying. Until then, this is Bill Walker saying good night. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.